I'd like to tell you a story about how we believe, what we believe about ourselves, our perceptions of ourselves, shape what we achieve in life. And that story begins on Christmas morning, 1989, when my brother and I ran downstairs, unwrapped Nintendo 1.0. <laughs> We were so excited. Nintendo, we had Mario Brothers, Duck Hunt, we were set. This was gonna be great. We loved playing Mario Brothers. Every time we got to a new level, we were like, this is awesome. How do we jump from tree to tree? This is so cool. We have to beat this level to see what the next level is gonna be. We'd get to the next level, there's an ocean. Now we have to teach Mario how to swim. Like, what is going on? This is so exciting. So. We would play for hours and hours just trying to get to the next level that we hadn't gotten to the day before, whatever, the last time we played. No matter how many times King Koopa killed us, we were ready for more. I love Mario Brothers so much that just about, let's say, 15 years later, I'm in graduate school and I'm in a GameStop shopping for my nephew's Christmas gift for a, a video game. And I look over in the corner of the store and I see this dusty looking old Nintendo for sale. And there's Mario Brothers 3 with it. And I'm like, score, 20 bucks? Like, this is great. <laughs> so I get the Nintendo and I rationalize in my head that, you know, I just need something mindless to keep my mind off of graduate school. But in really, I mean, we don't really know. I mean, I just really wanted to play Mario Brothers. So I get the Nintendo and I bring it back and I, I am in my apartment and I call my friends and I'm like, I got Mario Brothers. Come over, we're playing, you know, video games tonight. And they come over and we're playing and it's like five or six o'clock at night and all of a sudden, um, you know, things are going well. I, I play, I mean, I played a lot growing up. I'm not good at it at all. And so they had kind of decided in the beginning, they were like, we're going to beat the game tonight. Like we have to see what happens when we beat the game. This is going to be awesome. So I'm like, all right, cool. So we're playing along and we get, you know, we keep going and we get to this one little like mushroom hut and <laughs> there's a whistle. And if you've ever played the game, you know what happens when you get the whistle. You go to this like far off land and you start playing another level. I couldn't hack it in the new level. So they said to me that I could not play anymore because they really wanted to beat the game that night. So I had to respectfully bow out of the game and they continued to play. We got to, they, we, <laughs> they got to worlds that I've never seen before. I was like, wait, there's an ice world? Like I, all these things were going on. And they played until probably about two in the morning and their eyes were like literally ready to fall out. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were all dried out and they were like, oh my God, I, we have to beat the game, but we also have to go to bed. <laughs> and so they figured out a way to like turn the screen off and keep it on pause. There's no saving games, okay? This is Nintendo 1.0. There's no saving involved. And so they figured out this creative way to do it and they wake up the next morning and they get to the final King Koopa and they're like, this is awesome, we're gonna beat the game, and they did. And this is actually the screen that pops up when you beat the game, which was really cool. Um, and so they beat the game, and they were so excited, and you know, they were like, yes, we finally did it! And we celebrated for like two minutes, and then we got breakfast, and then they never wanted to play Mario Brothers ever again. <laughs> um, there was no allure anymore, right? Like once you beat the game, there's really no point in playing anymore. You don't really want to play anymore. And, you know, maybe uh, Mario Brothers is not your jam. Maybe you didn't grow up playing Mario Brothers. But we've all had that experience of playing, whether it's Solitaire or Candy Crush or Angry Birds, way longer than we'd ever like to tell anyone about it. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you think about that because... This, you know, in this day and age, time is so precious and there are so many distractions. But when we're playing those games, we're trying to get the next high score, when we're trying to beat a level, we are so focused, right? And hours just escape us. We're so engaged in just focusing on that game. 
if you think about it, if you're an educator or a manager or you have people that you want to get them to do something a certain way, this is actually kind of fascinating, right? That you can get people to get so engaged and focused for a certain amount of time. And the truth of the matter is that the reason we focus in on these games and we play them for hours on end is because it actually solicits a specific type of master, it's called mastery-driven motivation, a specific type of human motivation. And mastery-driven motivation, the joy is in the pursuit, right? It's not about beating the game. I mean, you're excited to beat the game, and you have those goals, but uh, it's really about, like, the excitement of getting to the next level. That's what motivates you. That's what keeps you stick, you know, playing more. Or like getting to the next high score. That's what's getting you so excited to continue playing. In mastery driven motivation in its most pure form, there is no end. There is no beating the game. Um, it, you know, when you look at it from uh, different skills that you're trying to work on or knowledge or expertise that you're trying to develop, you have to see the possibilities as endless for that kind of motivation to really last forever. And so mo mastery-driven motivation is something that we see not just in video games, but in a variety of different environments. And so I want to tell you one more story. And this one is about mastery-driven mo motivation as well, but it's in a school setting. So this story begins on a nice spring day in uh, English class for me. And I didn't really like English because there was a lot of writing papers, and I really didn't like writing papers. And I wasn't really good at it. And so, you know, I'm sitting there in this English class, and I'm just hoping to get a B minus. And the teacher shows up, and she's got this paper that I wrote last week, and she's handing it back. And I see the red ink from here, and I'm like, oh boy, this is not going to be good. And I can see in the corner of the paper a C plus circled. And I'm like, no, come on, I can never get good grades on papers. And she must have seen it in my face, because when she handed it back, she said, listen, Courtney, you can't worry, right? You're good at participating in class. You're good at other subjects. You're just not a good writer, and that's OK. And when she said that to me, it was interesting. I, I felt so relieved. I was like, similar to how my friends felt when they beat the game. I mean, I wasn't celebrating and jumping up and down, but that feeling of kind of being done with it, right? I didn't have to try anymore because I already knew that I was a bad writer. So there was no reason for me to work on that skill or try to get any better. I, I, was, I was what I was. And so for the following six years, I used that as a cop-out. Uh, for the rest of high school and all of college, I had decided I wasn't going to go get extra help on writing. When I got a bad grade back, I was like, eh, I'm not a good writer. Not a big deal. I'll get something, you know, I'll get, make up the points in another assignment. And so, I, I, you know, that's kind of how I thought about writing for, for a while. And so that was all about to get reframed for me uh, when I went to graduate school. You see, when I was in college, I was really involved. I was in a sorority, and I was an orientation leader, and I was involved in a lot of different things. And someone came up to me and was like, you should work with college students. Um, that would be a really great career for you. And I was like, this is so much fun. I would love to work with college students. Sign me up. And she's like, well, OK, you have to get a master. You have to get a master's degree. You have to go to graduate school. I was like, okay, how hard can it be? Like, sorority life is fun, and being a student leader is great, so this can't be that hard. The graduate programs are hard. <laughs> Doesn't really matter what they're in, they're difficult. And, um, and this particular graduate program is a kind of a mixture of education and psychology. So guess what? There's a lot of writing. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what did I sign up for? Wait. And so my, you know, I get there, I get to orientation, I, know, I find out that it's a lot, very intensive in writing which I was like not OK with. And then I find out that my first paper is due to the professor that is the toughest critic of writing, right? There are war stories about the way this, this woman uses red ink on papers. And I'm like terrified. So all of, a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, I have to kind of gut check myself and be like, listen, I can't just say I'm bad at writing anymore because it's graduate school. I can't, this is make it or break it here, and this is my career I'm talking about, so I can't really mess around. 
So I worked for days and nights and, you know, put more work into that first writing assignment than I had ever put into any assignment before. And I hand it in, and a couple classes later, the teacher comes around, the faculty member comes around, and she's handing back papers, and I can see the red ink from far away. And I'm thinking, oh man. And she hands it back, and there's a B plus on it. And I was like, yes, this is awesome. This is probably the highest grade I've ever gotten on like a writing assignment. And with the hardest teacher, right? And so I was so excited. And even though there was lots of red ink and everything else, she hands it back, and she says to me, you know, Courtney, you're a good writer. And I thought there, I, I, I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and I thought to myself, yes, I tricked her. She has no idea how bad I am at writing. <laughs> I didn't even believe in myself. Like, she believed in me, and I didn't even believe in myself. But at that moment, my next thought was, shoot, she thinks I'm a good writer. I have, like, a new standard I have to live up to now. And all of a sudden, I writing papers was like playing Mario Brothers, right? Like the next paper had to be better than the last one. And then the next paper, had to, I had to one-up myself again. I was, all, I was committed to becoming a better writer because I had to live up to this standard that this woman had said to me, you know, you're a good writer. And so for the first time in my life, I was like looking for feedback. I met with faculty members. I took what they said and I implemented it in my next paper. I was completely committed to working on my writing. And two years later, I became a much more confident writer. So much so that after I graduated grad school, a weird thing happened. I missed writing. <laughs> Here was something that I thought was a disgusting chore, and now was kind of a hobby. And I, you know, and so I missed kind of writing, and I decided I was going to start blogging. And I started a blog, and maybe like seven people read the blog. But it was, you know, it was a great opportunity for me to share my ideas, share my ideas about the work I was doing with students, about, you know, innovation, things I was passionate about. Um, it was a great opportunity for me to practice my writing. And I'm really glad I gave myself that practice because Something I learned down the line is opportunities are going to come and go, and sometimes you're going to need to rely on the, these skills, writing, public speaking, whatever it is, to take on those opportunities. And so the more you work on them, the better off you are when that opportunity comes knocking. And so for me, I had, you know, I, I was doing some blogging right after graduate school. Fast forward five or six years, and last fall, I had a door open to an incredible opportunity. For the first time, I was able to share my blogs, my ideas, on the Huffington Post, <laughs> which was incredible. This was a great opportunity for me to share my ideas about education and leadership and innovation. And what I found is that by sharing it through uh, you know, the venue of Huffington Post, I've been able to connect with educators all over the world. Not all of them agreeing with what I'm saying <laughs> at all, but some of them, it's inspiring, you know? And, and you get to connect with both types of people, and it's really been a great opportunity. The blog post that you see on the screen there is just incredible um, for me. It was shared two, over 2,000 times on social media, this blog post. And for someone that, in high school, <laughs> was told that I wasn't going to be a good writer, or wasn't a good writer and that was OK, to write something that people don't just read, but they feel compelled to share, is very meaningful and has been a very, you know, an incredible experience for me. And it just goes to show that what we believe about ourselves truly does shape what we are able to achieve. And that's not just a cheesy quote, you know, or it, that's grounded in decades of psychology research and research on human motivation. The, you know, I've told this story a couple times, and sometimes the reaction is, oh, that teacher that told you you were bad at, you know, writing, like, she should not have a job. 
okay, calm down. <laughs> we've all done this, right? Like, we've all said, hey, you know, Johnny, you're not going to be a scientist, but there's a lot of other things that you can do, so it's all good, right? It, it, it looks a little different every time, but every time you say, oh, you know what, you're just not meant to be an athlete, try drama. Like, any anything that looks like that, in the workplace even, um, when we say things like, you know, you're just not a people person, but that's okay because you're good at this, this, and this. We do it all the time. That teacher is not, you know, it wasn't malicious intentions that made her say that. She was trying to be helpful in her mind. And I think we do that all the time, just trying to be helpful. And why I wanted to start presenting about this topic and share my story is in hopes that leaders and educators, coaches, parents will stop kind of saying these things and stop kind of trying to rationalize what, you know, our kids, our students, our people are good or not good at by saying, you know what, you're just not meant to do that. You're not wired to do that. What we really need to be doing is we need to, you know, think about the the two similarities between the stories I told, one in high school and one in graduate school. Both educators are handing back you know, these papers, and both of them had red ink all over them. The secret is in the red ink. That's so important. That feedback is what helps us grow and achieve and keep going. And the difference between those two instances was that one of those papers was handed back. Even it was covered in red ink, it was handed back with hope and with a belief in my potential. And that's when you take the feedback and you start to really are able to use it and grow and continue to improve. And so what I'd like to see more educators, leaders, whoever it is, is give thoughtful, constructive feedback to your people and believe in them that they can improve and get better. Um, you know, life's not like Mario Brothers, right? We don't always know when we've made it to the next level. So positive feedback is also really important. If we've improved from month to month, we need to hear that. And we don't always know when we're about to get killed by King Koopa. So we also need to make sure that we are giving that kind of feedback and identifying, hey, listen, this didn't work out so well. Here are some strategies to improve. I know you can do this. And so, you know, I think about some of the statistics about the issue with science and math in this country. And one of them being that over half of the high school graduating class from last year, 2013, was not prepared for college level math. And what I'm proposing is not that you know, we implement a new eight point plan for curriculum reform or that we try to do some new standardized testing regime. What I am proposing is very simple. Stop telling kids they are bad at math. Thank you. <laughs>